Good morning. I like it. I heard you. But I'm having an issue here. Hold on. There we go. So last week, this is our Easter break in this district, Placentia or Belinda. So we're off this week. But um, last week, oh, my word. Oh, my goodness. If I could have just had every one of you there as a ladybug on the wall to see what went down inside these chapels. Um, I've only heard, I have a huge staff, and we were in all 21 schools. I've only heard from about five teachers, including myself, about what the outcome was from last week. We're talking 30-some kids getting saved in, and it, within five, I mean, it was, what, well, these kids are bawling, okay? They're seeing that Jesus, oh, I got chills, their only hope, and they're laying down their lives for him. They're giving their lives to him and surrendering to him at such an early age. And, ah, oh, precious, precious. Um, you know, when you see a child have that aha moment, and there's not a whole lot better than that, <laughs> and you see the light bulb go on, you're like, oh, I get it. So we were watching a video called Who is Jesus? It's no longer in circulation. You have to get them off of eBay of people who are selling them. Um, but it is just the most incredible portrayal, do you agree, of the love of Jesus, um, his compassion, and his, it, it's, it's, it, there is none better, I don't, I don't think. You agree? Okay. At straight scripture. This is taken from the book of Matthew, verbatim in the NIV, the old one. And um, this is a 30-minute excerpt taken from that huge, gigantic movie, um, Incredible, incredible. Um, so at the very end of the movie, after um, the crucifixion, you see the risen Lord walking on the path, like to in the garden. And one of my girls had that aha moment, and she goes, <gasps> it's Jesus. And the class just erupted in applause for her because she got it. And, oh, what a glorious day that was. Anyway, but we do have a risen Savior, and our hope is built on him and him alone. Amen? Amen. Nothing else this world can offer us can compare to the life that we have in Jesus. So let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for laying your life down for us, for taking it up again. Lord, we know the cross. You said it is finished, but that's not where it stopped. Lord, you rose again. You defeated death. You defeated the enemy. You defeated that grave. That victory that you have, Lord, is ours. Lord, may we walk in it. May we know who we are in you. Oh, Jesus, thank you for going to that cross for us. Oh, Lord, where would we be without you? You are our hope. You are our firm foundation our rock in which we need to build our lives, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame
Lord, you're our Jehovah, Lord. You're our God who sees us. Oh, Lord, and you are our Jehovah, Ra'ah. You are our shepherd, Lord. You lead us. You guide us. You protect us. You make a way for us. Lord, you, you anoint us with, with oil, Lord. You groom us. You transform us to be more like you. Thank you. We praise you, Lord. Lord, just like that Shunammite woman who lost her child. You saw her. Lord, I thank you for the faith that she had. Lord, may we display faith, courage in you because you are our Savior. You are our rock. There was no one higher than you. Oh, Lord, I pray you would be exalted in each one of our lives this day. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust everyone's still basking in the glow of Resurrection Week, huh? What an awesome celebration. Oh. If anyone still needs um, verses, come on up, and there's some up right up here in front, and don't forget prayer cards. What a precious group of women you are, and I'm so thankful to be here this morning. <laughs> Let's bow in prayer before we start. Oh, praiseworthy Lord, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for seeing us, for knowing us, for knowing just what we need, Lord. Thank you for your promises, your promises to supply all of our needs. And Lord, beyond that, for gracing us with life and eternity and fellowship. We love you, Lord. Be with us now as we... As we open your word, just speak powerfully to us. As Cindy said, Lord, I just praise your name this morning. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. I have for many, many years in my life, I think it dates back to Sunday school, been fascinated by the church, especially in China, and stories of uh, just throughout history of missionaries to China and so on. And one man that some of you may have heard of before is a man named Pastor Alan Wan, who was a towering figure in China's under, underground, thanks, underground house church movement throughout the 20th century. At one point, he, not unusual in that time and place, was imprisoned for more than 20 years for refusing to, to join the official government-controlled Protestant church under communism. His wife, Alice, was known through the prison years and beyond for her perseverance and gracious hospitality to anybody that knocked on their door right up until her death in 2010. Alice had five children and her mother-in-law to care for during Alan's prison years. She secured a hard labor job moving construction rubble by pushing heavy push wagons, earning 80 cents a day, not nearly enough to provide for her large family. And one night, her mother-in-law announced to her, Alice, there's no rice to feed the children tomorrow morning. Alice got angry and complained to the Lord. He was supposed to take care of them, she said. But then she opened her Bible to Matthew, where Jesus says, if God cares for the birds, then will he not also care for you? She writes the story that her heart was rebuked. She asked God's forgiveness and went to sleep peacefully. And sure enough, the next morning before 6 o'clock, there was a knock on the door. There stood a stranger with a big box in her hands. Alice invited her in and put on the tea kettle for some tea. But the stranger just walked to the table, set the box down, and began to leave. Alice said, wait a minute, what's your name? The woman replied, I have no name. Just thank God for the box. She disappeared. Alice opened the box to find rice and meat and vegetables in an envelope with more money than two months' worth of salary. Truthfully, you and I don't need to go 
years away or years ago and miles away to remind us that our God is good or that the tiniest details of our lives matter to him. After all, the most frequent promise in the Bible, you know this one is, I will be with you. Before Adam or Eve and Eve ever sinned or needed forgiveness, God promised his presence. And that same pres promise of presence through scripture came to Enoch, to Noah, to Abraham, Sarah, Jacob, Jeremiah, Mary, Paul, too many to list. To Moses, God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And we know that when Jesus himself came to earth, his name of redemption was Emmanuel, God with us. When Jesus left, he promised to send the spirit so that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. His heart's desire always that we would be his children, his companions, his redeemed dwelling places. I believe this, the Lord certainly desired that for the rebellious kingdom of Israel as well. After all, we read in Jeremiah, he had loved them with an everlasting love. Yet in our study so far, if we think about it, it's been rare to find those with true affection toward God, with hearts desiring to be in his presence. We've seen a nation marked by deep idolatry, an infamously rebellious and defiant kings, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram, none of them even dared to seek Yahweh or the direction that he might give. Still, praise God, not everyone in Israel rejected the Lord. In the days of Elijah, we know God preserved 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal. And now in the days of Elisha, there were faithful people as well. We have the privilege of meeting five of them today, five nameless but beloved saints of the remnant, each one living to honor the Lord, each in the midst of a great personal challenge, each intent upon seeking the presence of Yahweh for help and hope each drawn to God's miraculous power, mercy, and blessing through Elisha. I love 2 Chronicles 20.12. We are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And Psalm 71.20. You who have shown me many troubles and distresses will revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You see, indeed, the very sovereign Lord that had allowed suffering to come to his covenant nation, to his covenant people, according to his own wise and loving purposes, would be the same sovereign that would now bring salvation, joy, and amazing grace. So let's get into our stories. I love the stories this morning. And our first one, our first section is entitled, Grace Pays the Debt. So if you'd like to open to 2 Kings 4, Grace pays the debt. We'll read the first seven or the first seven verses. Second Kings four. Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, "Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves." Elisha said to her, "What shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house?" And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels at large for yourself from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. In other words, do not, don't just get a few. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels. And you shall set aside what is full. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not one vessel more. And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Psalm 142.2 I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. So one day our story begins. A desperate widow approached Elisha with an urgent plea. Her husband, one of the true prophets in the land, had died. It's interesting how we discover here that God's men, these prophets, were not like monks that were closed off from the rest of the world, learning and living in some remote place. They had wives and families. 
This man had been a faithful, sacrificial servant in a hard time, perhaps even under the realm of um, Ahab and Jezebel, we might think, when such fidelity to Yahweh was a great risk. In those days, the law required that if a person died in financial debt, the debt would be paid, would need to be paid by the children. Bankruptcy wasn't an option. So here a creditor was now coming to take the widow's two boys as indentured servants. They could work off their father's obligation as it went. This widow was despairing, understandably. To lose her husband and her sons was unthinkable. How did she respond is a great question for to us to ask. She cried out to Elisha, to God's servant. And by appealing to his servant, she was appealing to God himself. Her faith and hope were anchored in Yahweh. I love her step of faith. And how did Elisha respond? How can I help you, he asked. How can I help you? What comforting words to hear and words that speak so clearly to God's own heart. As we read in Psalm 68, 5, a father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Love that verse. Elisha went on, tell me what do you have in your house? She responded, well, nothing at all except a small jar of olive oil. She probably had basic furniture and clothes and utensils, but the only thing likely worth anything was a little small jar of olive oil. But that was enough for Elisha. He said, go around, ask all your neighbors for empty jars, as many as you can, whatever they have, then go inside with your boys, shut the door behind you, and pour oil into every jar. It was as if the Elisha said to this woman, dear woman, you've got a lot of emptiness in your life, but not enough emptiness. So gather together some more emptiness. Go back to your empty house and empty cupboard and close the door behind you. I want you to see what God can do with emptiness. Have you learned in your own life that God often begins his mighty working with what we already have, as small as we may think it is? Moses had a rod in his hand. Peter and his partners had fishing nets. The young boy in Galilee held a few loaves and fishes in his hands. Lydia had a home. Paul had a pen and plenty of time in a prison cell. The woman here had a jar of oil. It's interesting. In Hebrew, the word is asuk, A-S-U-K. It describes not a large container that she perhaps would use to store cooking oil but that little small flask of oil used only for anointing. What usually happens when we pour a smart, small jar of anything into a large one? Well, the small, small jar gets empty, but not this time. In response to the widow's tenacious faith and willing obedience, God saved this family with his gracious oil. I love that we see no questioning in her, no hesitation, no, I've never seen this work before kind of idea. She believed the promise of God. She started pouring and pouring and pouring. And I love verse 6. Bring me another jar, she says. And her son says, but there aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. As long as she kept pouring, the oil kept flowing. And is there anyone else out here besides me who would love to know what that oil tasted like? With the door closed and no distractions, what an intimate time of worship and wonder it must have been for that mom and her two sons. No crowds to clamor for the magic jar. <laughs> the family could focus on the overflowing love of God as they watched the overflowing oil. As Jesus told his servants at the wedding in Cana, where there was no wine, fill the pots with water, so they filled them to the brim. In the Bible, oil always depicts or pictures or symbolizes the Holy Spirit, as oil provided both food and fuel in Israel. So the Holy Spirit provides us with both spiritual nourishment and energy to walk this life of faith to God's glory in his power. The picture here is so wonderfully clear. The Lord will continue to flow through us, cracked vessels as we may be, as long as we are emptied of ourselves, emptied of the world, as long as we are fillable, available, usable. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. 
A full Christ is for empty sinners and for empty sinners only. As long as there is a really empty soul, so long will a blessing go forth with the word. It is not our emptiness, but our fullness of self that hinders the outgoing of grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit is where it all begins. And what a truth that we should also, as believers, gather around us empty vessels, our friends, our family, those in need, those in need of Jesus first and foremost, that we should have the gift of pouring into them, even as the Spirit pours into us. No oil is ever wasted if we continue to empty ourselves into the people around us. 2 Corinthians 9.8 says, God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So God paid the debt. Now let's move to our second story. Grace, or grace imparts life. So from grace pays the debt to grace imparts life. Let's read from verses 8 through 17. We get to meet one of the most remarkable people in the Bible, I believe. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. I love that little verse or that translation. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. She said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please let us make a little walled upper chamber. And let us set a bed for him there, and a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. One day he, Elisha, came there and turned into the upper chamber and rested. And then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. Verse 13 now. He said to him, say now to her, behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Would you be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the army? And she answered, I live along, uh, among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, truly she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, Elisha said, at this season next year you will embrace a son. And she said, oh no, my Lord, O oh man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. But verse 17, the woman conceived and bore a son at that season the next year, just as Elisha had said to her. Proverbs 31.10, a wife of noble character who can find, she is worth far more than rubies. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And here in 2 Kings 4, we find such a noble and praiseworthy woman of God. Isn't it interesting that we don't know her name, but we certainly know her character. She lived in a place called Shunem, that's what we read first and foremost, in the area of the tribe of Issachar, not far from the Sea of Galilee. Shunem was a little town that lay between Abel Mahola, the hometown of Elisha, and Mount Carmel. So it seems like a perfect waypoint or halfway point for Elisha as he would journey home or to Carmel or to Gilgal or Bethel on his journeys through Israel. She is the only woman in the entire Old Testament, I love this, who was ever called great. And the word refers to more than just wealth or status. It indicates that she was respected and wise, a leader, a woman of character. We know that she had no children. Her husband was older, the Bible tells us. Perhaps she'd just given up hope years before of ever being a mom, content to be a well-liked member of her town, busy with civic activities and concerns. We know childlessness in those days was often taken as a sign of disfavor or shame among God's people. And beyond that, Jewish women without children experienced great disappointment at not being the one chosen through whom the Lord would bring the long-expected Messiah. We see then in her personal lack and in the pain and sorrow it likely brought her over the years that she resisted turning toward focusing on herself. Instead, she turned toward others in sacrifice and service. Romans 12:13 certainly describes her well. 
in the New Living Translation, I think this is, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. You see, she noticed Elisha. That's where it began. She saw his need. She had him in for dinner. She had him in for dinner several times. And then she had such reverence for this man of God, she went out of her way to prepare a place for him to stay. She said to her husband, I know this man who often comes our way as a holy man of God. Let's bring him into our home. I love this example of complementary marriage partnership that we see here. She was sensitive to a need. She noticed, and he was amenable to helping get things done. They created a little apartment for Elisha, not just a bed, but a table, a chair, a lamp. Just think about it. He could sleep. He could study and write. He could come and go as he wanted. He could pray in the privacy of his own home. A great deal of thought went into this home away from home. Such a perfect picture of holy hospitality. I found this definition. The act or practice of receiving and entertaining strangers or guests without reward or with kind and generous liberality. 1 Peter 4 tells us to be hospitable toward one another without complaint. And of course, Hebrews 13 too, many of you know this verse, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this, by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Yes, this beautiful Shunammite woman was very, very good to Elisha, and he wanted to bless her in return. Not only was he right and honorable in reaching out to her, but he evidently had great influence. This kind of made me smile a little bit. Can I ask the king for a favor on your, on your behalf, he offered. Can he ask the commander of the army to protect you in some way? Apparently, she didn't want anything. I can hear in my mind's eye, I can hear a sweet answer. Oh, no thanks. I don't need a thing. I'm secure here. I'm perfectly satisfied with my family and friends. It's a good life. All is well. But Elisha persisted and called again for the servant Gehazi. There's got to be something we can do for her. But what? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son, and her husband is an old man. When Elisha heard Gehazi's thoughts, it seems like the Holy Spirit immediately confirmed to him that that was genuinely what the Lord wanted to do for her, to give her what she really, really, down in the deepest core of her heart, had always longed for. So beyond her wildest dreams or expectations, a year later, this great but humble woman had a son. She who had so generously provided material things for the prophet of God was now blessed by the God of the prophet, blessed far beyond material things, to be sure. Let's see what happens next. Our third section, grace restores life. Grace pays a debt. Grace brings life. Now grace restores life. This is quite a long section, but I hope you don't mind if we just read it all in one, in one take. It's such a, a, a beautiful and powerful piece of scripture. We're going to start at verse 18, and we'll go all the way to 37. When the child was grown, the day came that he went out to his father to the reapers. He said to his father, my head, my head. And he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her lap until noon and then died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and return. He said, why will you go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, it will be well. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward and do not slow down the pace for me unless I tell you. So she went and came to the man of God to Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her at a distance, he said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, there is the Shunammite. Please run now to meet her and say, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught hold of his feet. And God, Gehazi came near to push her away, but the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is troubled within her. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, 
Did I ask for a son from my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand and go your way. If you meet any man, do not salute him. And if anyone salutes you, do not answer him and lay my staff on the lad's face. The mother of the lad said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And he, Elisha, arose and followed her. Now verse 31. Then Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff on the lad's face, but there was no sound or response. So he returned to meet him and told him, the lad has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, behold, the lad was dead and laid on his bed. So he entered and shut the door behind them both and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child <laughs> and put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself on him and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he returned and walked in the house once back and forth and went up and stretched himself on him. And the lad sneezed seven times and the lad opened his eyes. He called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came in to him, he said, take up your son. Then she went in and fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, and she took up her son and went out. <laughs> Excuse the tears, please. An incredibly heart-stopping story. From a parent's worst nightmare, <laughs> to an example of grace's greatest work. Can't we just imagine the day beginning like any other in the life of the Shunammite woman, ruffling the hair of her beloved boy, sending him out with his dad to work in the fields for the day. Then not long after, a severe and intolerable pain in his head. His father sending him home to his unsuspecting mom, where he sat on her lap with his breath becoming more and more ragged. Then he would take his last breath. What must have been swirling through her mind as she watched this tragedy unfold? Was she shocked? Was she stunned? Was she broken? As a woman of faith, she would have no doubt heard about the story of Elijah raising the widow's son way up north in Zarephath. She might even have thought on the older stories in scripture she knew. Perhaps Abraham's act of faith in taking young, young Isaac to Mount Moriah and laying him on the altar there. Hebrews 11 gives us a keen insight. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Did God's spirit enable and embolden this woman with that same conviction, with that same hope? Was that why he laid, or she, she laid her boy on Elisha's bed and not on his own? What was it that gave her the strength to be a woman of action at this desperate moment rather than to fall apart into a million pieces? As she felt her boy's lifeless form in her arms, she made an important decision. She would go to the man of God. She would go to God. A woman on a mission, she knew what her first priority must be. And James 5 says it to us this way. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. And then, of course, the righteous prayer, or the fervent prayer of a righteous man, avails much, is effective. So the mom carried her boy's body up to Elisha's own room, laid him on the bed, and closed the door behind her. She went out to her husband and asked for a donkey for transport and a servant to accompany her. She had an important journey to undertake. Going to see Elisha evidently wasn't unheard of, but usually only happened on special days as we read in our verses, the Sabbath or the new moon, in other words, to celebrate a new month. Her husband questioned her plans but he took care of her nonetheless with her assuring word. Can't you hear this? It's fine, dear. All is well. Don't ask questions just now. Trust me, I'll be home soon. She set out rapidly for Carmel. She just had to get to Elisha to bring him home to her boy. 
Elisha recognized her from a distance and told Gehazi to run and see what she needed. As she had with her husband, here again with Gehazi, she held her feelings in check. All is well, everything is fine, until she would get to her friend, the man of God she so trusted. With Elisha, she let everything go. In bitter agony, holding onto his feet tightly, tears falling, she was in visceral pain, and Elisha knew it. He immediately sent Gehazi on back to Shunem, carrying his staff, a representation of his own presence. But this desperate mom would not be dissuaded. Elisha must return with her. What did we read? As sure as God lives and you live, I'm not leaving with, unless you come with me, she said. Through Elisha's own words and God's power, the Lord had brought forth her boy in the first place. Now she needed Elisha's authority and Yahweh's life-giving power once again. It's interesting that the staff in Gehazi's hands had no healing effect. So when Elisha finally arrived, he went up into that little apartment tabernacle, shut the door, and began to pray fervently. Upon the boy he led, laid, mouth to mouth, eye to eye, hand to hand. It's interesting that the scripture is so personal. Just as Jesus does for us sinners, as sinners, Elisha identified with, reckoned with, each part of the boy's flesh, each part of his body. He walked, he prayed, he laid himself down again, and then first came wart, then came seven sneezes, then eyes opened, and then there was life. There was resurrection life. And I love Elisha's words. Precious woman, come take your son. Sometimes joy is just too deep for words we know. All we can do is offer silent thanksgiving and carry on. Imagine the heart of this Shunammite saint witnessing the power of God over life and death in her very home, the home she had invited the spirit into in the form of Elisha the prophet. God came closer to her than ever before. She saw the king of heaven and earth and his amazing grace, and she bowed in awe, we read. Luke 15, 24, I think she could have said these same words. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. There is such an interesting postscript to this story. I would imagine some of you know this. But in the time of the New Testament, so centuries later, the village of Schumann was actually no longer inhabited. Over the years, the Shunammites had drifted and gathered in a new little village, less than 10 miles away, a town called Nain. Surely the people of Nain would have known as the legacy of stories passed from one generation to another that the prophet Elisha had come to their village hundreds of years, eight centuries before, and had raised a young boy from the dead. So when, as Luke 7 records, Jesus brought back to life the son of a widow in the very same town of Nain, the awestruck people could proclaim once again, a great prophet has appeared among us. God has come to help his people. Dale Davis says, how the story of the Shunammite woman reveals our God, the God who delights to amaze. He delights to amaze his ordinary people with his good gifts, who sometimes baffles us with the mysterious sorrow he brings, who places limitations on his servants so that we will never esteem them too highly, and who gives us a sneak preview in 800 BC that not even death will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, two more stories this morning. Our fourth section, Grace Removes the Curse. Grace Removes the Curse. And we'll read just a couple of verses, 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. Let's pick up in verse 38. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the son of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons and the, of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, for they did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat, and as they were eating of the stew, they cried out and said, O oh man of God, there is death in the pot. And they were unable to eat. But he said, Now bring meal. 
he threw it into the pot and said, pour it out for the people that they may eat. Then there was no harm in the pot. This reminds me of the, uh, the story Sierra told us about the, the freshening of the water in Jericho. It is good to remind ourselves, I think, as we read these stories of heartbreak and great need, that they are happening in the land of promise, the land God swore to give to Israel, the land which he certainly had given through the Red Sea and across the Jordan River, the land he had promised again and again to bless and to make fruitful if Israel would only treasure and obey him. Deuteronomy 28.12 announces, The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. But just as true, God had also promised an outcome if they wouldn't obey his word. Later on in Deuteronomy 28, we read, The heaven which is over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down on you. And this through the prophet Amos. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. So now on Israel, drenched as it was in the cult of Baal, the supposed god of rain we should remember, a famine of powder and dust had fallen exactly as God had promised. Yes, of course, the real problem in the land was this spiritual famine brought on by idolatry and people seeking to live without the word of God. When famine is in the land, I think we can say people starve, and when people are starving, they are reduced to eat what isn't necessarily good for them. Our story here is heavy with meaning. So Elisha and the company of prophets were gathered together. He was li likely teaching them from the scripture. And Elisha, apparently in charge of the meal, told his servant to put on a pot of stew for everybody. As they began to cook, one of them went out to look into the fields to look for herbs to season up what was probably a very thin and meager stew. In his search, he came upon some gourds and we can imagine excitedly filled up his cloak with as many as he could carry. They were cut up into the bubbling pot and the stew was dished out to all the men. And as soon as it was tasted, uh-oh, death in the pot. The gourds that had looked so good were poisonous. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Elisha quickly put some good flour into the stew, and God's grace removed the curse. What was once so bad that it brought illness and likely death was now made good. I was scribbling these notes, and I couldn't help but think of the lyric in the song, Joy to the World. No, let, no more let sins and sorrows grow, no thorn, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. So what's our lesson here? It can be easy to do what this unnamed young prophet did, to go out into the world for things that we will help to satisfy us, help enrich our lives, help add flavor and zest. Instead, they bring us death. As children of God, we never find true heart satisfaction or soul nourishment on the things of the world, especially things, as the Bible says, they did not know what they were. A life where the most important things are pleasure, comfort, fame, wealth, these things in the stew of our lives as believers, death in the pot. Pastor David Guzik offers these thoughts. What of the church? How is the church to meet this when destructive and poisonous doctrines invade the family of God? We are to imitate Elisha. Yes, there surely is a time to remove, remove poison from among believers, but first we must add as much good spiritual food as possible. We need not attempt to immediately get the wild gourds out of the pot. They are cut very small and cunningly mixed in. What then? We look to God for his help and use his means. Bring meal, bring flour, the ingredient in making bread. Bring Jesus, bring the bread of life. With God's gracious working, cast the blessed gospel of grace into the stew. Put the focus on Jesus and his life-giving word, and just watch how God gets the death out of a once-poisoned stew. I love that thought. One more story, ladies. 
One more portion of scripture, and again, just the last few verses here, 42 through 44. Grace satisfies the hungry. Grace satisfies the hungry. Now a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And he said, give them to the people that they may eat. His attendant said, what, will I set this before a hundred men? But he said, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. How many of you are thinking of a hill in Galilee many years after, huh? In apostate Israel, it's interesting, there was no official temple to Yahweh. Not surprising, but interesting. Many of the faithful Levitical priests had returned to Judah when the nation had divided in the first place. With no sanctuary where people could bring tithes and offerings, they would often bring them to the nearest school of prophets, and we believe that's what's happening here. Here, a generous and faithful man from a place called Baal Shalisha. Interestingly enough, many believe the meaning of that name to be the Lord of Multiplying came to Elisha bringing 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain. It's not hard to imagine or savor the taste and aroma of fresh bread, of this fresh bread, or to recognize the labor that went into producing it. And we're not one bit surprised to find that Elisha, in accordance with Mosaic law, and a good heart, I would say, was set to share the offering with the group gathered there. The crowd would dine on the Lord's own meal, the food God had provided in the first place, the food brought back to the Lord in this offering. We're told this gift of, of bread and grain was special. You read that in, in your verses as well. It was food from the first fruits. On the Jewish calendar, the feast of first fruits was held in early spring at the beginning of the grain harvest. And Leviticus 23 mandated to God's people that no other grain could be harvested or enjoyed until this offering was brought to the Lord. Offerings of the first fruits could be roasted heads of grain, fine flour baked into cakes, loaves of bread. These gifts acknowledged God's provision. Yes, for food and for housing and, and families, but for the land itself. For we new covenant believers, I love this, that there's another deeply beautiful significance to first fruits. At she as sheaves of the first fruits offering were set apart for the Lord, so too we believers are set apart for holiness in God's glory. So just as in Jesus' day on that Galilee hillside among a crowd of 5,000 with only five loaves and two fish available, Elisha also had just a few loaves to feed many. The disciples had their doubts with Jesus, you'll remember that, and so did Gehazi in our story here. How can this work? There isn't enough bread. Beyond that, I found this interesting. Barley was always regarded as simple food, better for feeding animals than people. In the Jewish Talmud, one man says, there is a fine crop of barley, and the other, another answers, tell it to the horses and donkeys. <laughs> Humble barley loaves weren't much to work with, but we know our God doesn't need much. In his grace, few loaves were made many. There was more than enough. They ate and then had some left over, and here's the phrase I love, all according to the word of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon says, do you think God needs our numbers? Do you think he's dependent upon human strength? I tell you, our weakness is a better weapon for God than our strength. Unflinchingly, Elisha trusted the promise of God, acted on it, and saw another miraculous fulfillment. Here in 2 Kings, it was 20 loaves for 100 or so people. In the ministry of Jesus, it was five loaves for 5,000. And soon after, you'll remember that Matthew and Mark tell us it was another seven loaves for another crowd of 4,000. In 2 Kings, there was some left over. But in Galilee, 12 big baskets were filled with the abundance. God, yes, certainly did a wonderful work through Elisha. What a beautiful preview, just a preview of the much greater work God would do through our Lord Jesus, the true bread of heaven. I love this short passage and its clear message for us, its lesson for us. 
The issue is never the small number of lobes we have. The needful thing is always to see beyond the lobes to the Almighty who owns and provides the lobes in the first place. God wants us measuring life and all that concerns us by his infinite abilities. Out of his riches, our every need is met. He promised. John 6, 32. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Who comes to me, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. To that I say amen. We look back over today and we see a desperate widow, a distraught mother, an inedible stew, a hungry crowd, and yes, one obedient, spirit-filled prophet of God with a heart that said, how can I help? By grace, each one of these at the end of their rope, those met by Elisha today, saved out of their circumstances through faith. Their faith in the one true God, the God of the mountains and the God of the valley, the God of the nations and the kings, the God of all authority over creation and time and space, and yes, the God of our homes and our families, the God of our hearts and the God of our deepest needs. Oh, ladies, see today what God has done and what he will do. Today, grace paid a debt, brought life, restored a lost life, removed a curse, and fed the hungry. What a perfect picture of our life hidden in Christ, a life secured on the cross and out of the tomb. Mark 10.45 reminds us, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We worship a good, good God, worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Today has been a day of stories, granted, but I'd like to include just one more as we close here. Some of you know the author Randy Alcorn. I've enjoyed his books very, very much. His wife, Nancy, was called home to heaven just almost exactly two years ago after a very, very tough four-year battle with cancer. Recently, looking backward, Randy Alcorn wrote this heartfelt word. The single greatest help to my grieving well is that I have come to truly sense Jesus with me. He is my friend and is with me and walking alongside me. The friendship of Jesus is the most comforting reality in my life. I sense his presence not only as I read my Bible and pray, but also as I walk our dog, Gracie. Nancy and I picked her out together. And as I write and as I eat and meet with friends and watch a good movie. This loss is not what I would have chosen, but my loss is Nancy's gain, and Nancy is heaven's gain. I have not resented my Lord even for a moment, though if I did, I know he would be quick to forgive me. His scarred hands and feet, which I think will be the only disfigurements in the resurrection, are the only reminder I need to trust him. Emmanuel promises, lo, I am with you always. Lord Jesus, we just bow before you today, so thankful, Lord Jesus, for who you are, for the gift of life you have given us, for the amazing examples we have in our passages today of you. Hundreds of years before you came to earth, Lord, your spirit was alive and well in Elisha. Thank you for satisfying needs. Thank you for our recognizing our heart's desires. Thank you for knowing us and seeing us and loving us and forgiving us. Lord Jesus, I just praise you now for the women that are here in the room and those watching it at home. Lord Jesus, for their families, for their circumstances, whatever they may be. Lord Jesus, may we, we be fervent in our prayers. May we be quick to seek you. Lord Jesus, we love you. In your name, amen. <laughs>